It was the summer of 1970, just one year after the United States began withdrawing its troops from Vietnam, signaling the war was nearing its end. Yet for many soldiers scattered across South Vietnam, the horrors of war were still painfully real. Men of the 101st Airborne were sent to a remote region of the Asha Valley, given its key tactical importance to the North Vietnamese. The Americans' objective for the broader operation Chicago Peak was a remote and abandoned base which relied on a helicopter lifeline for supplies and personnel, leaving only one way in or out. However, its importance was critical to disrupt enemy supply lines in the region. In response, thousands of North Vietnamese forces converged on Ripcord in what would become one of the bloodiest and most intense combat of the entire war. These 23 days in hell for the Battle of Firebase Ripcord would be the last major wide-ranging event between the US and North Vietnamese armies before the war ended. The operations that led to the Battle of Fire Support Base Raid Ripcord began in March 1970 as US forces prepared to secure the high ground in the Asha Valley prior to Operation Chicago Peak. On March 12, 1970, the 101st Airborne Division, specifically 2nd Battalion of its 506th Infantry Regiment, started focusing on retaking key positions such as Hill 902 and Hill 927, where Fire Support Base Ripcord used to be located. Their mission was to clear the area of the North Vietnamese Army forces and establish a fire base that could provide artillery support for the upcoming operation. On two occasions during March of 1970, American troops attempted to seize Hill 927. However, the dense jungles, mountainous terrain, and the enemy's readiness made the mission extremely challenging. On April 11, 1970, the final assault on the hill began. Soldiers of the Charlie Company advanced up the open slope but found no enemy on the hill. There was no enemy fire even when the first Chinook flew in carrying a bulldozer. The air was clear for the landing of supplies and equipment. With no resistance from the North Vietnamese forces, the U.S. soldiers were finally able to secure the firebase. Fire support base ripcord sat atop Hill 927. It was a figure eight shape divided into two main sections. The higher, wider southeast side held the 105 mm howitzer battery. A smaller, narrow lower tier on the northwest side was home to the 155 mm artillery battery. The Tactical Operations Center, or TOC, where officers planned and monitored the battle was on the eastern side of the base, protected by sandbags. The base also had a small helipad in front of the TOC for helicopter landings. Around the base, soldiers manned fighting positions, keeping watch over the perimeter. The base was surrounded by jungle-covered hills, making it hard to see its enemy. The key hills near Ripcord were Hill 805 to the southeast and Hill 1000 to the northwest. Further southwest was Hill 902. These hills provided perfect cover for enemy forces, who as soon as they heard news of a firebase being installed, started massing their troops. By the end of June, the NVAs brought two reinforced divisions to the area with one task only, wipe out the Ripcord FSB and kill everyone inside. The morning of July 1st, 1970 was an ordinary one. Lieutenant Colonel Andre Lucas, commanding officer of the 2nd Battalion, 506th Infantry, 101st Airborne Division, manning the base was inside the TOC, going over intelligence reports. Suddenly, a mortar round hit the entrance to the well-protected TOC, signaling the first attack on the ripcord. In a split second, the base was showered by a rain of mortar rounds, followed by an assault of enemy soldiers with automatic rifles and RPGs from the nearby hill. Well-trained soldiers were quick to react and responded with fire from all available arms, including 105mm and 155mm howitzers. However, hitting the enemy under the thick jungle canopy was not an easy task. The North Vietnamese Army forces were well prepared and used the dense jungle and hills around the base to their advantage. They were positioned on ridgelines around the base, but most of them attacked from Hill 805. Less than 15 minutes after the first mortar rounds hit the base, the air support arrived at the scene. An OH-6A light observation helicopter scouting the area looking for enemy mortar positions and Cobra gunships to strike them. Later, a small O-1 bird dog plane appeared over the battlefield marking enemy targets with white phosphorus rockets for F-4 Phantom jets to drop bombs and napalm. 
Even against such formidable firepower, the NVAs persisted and kept shooting at soldiers at the base. It seemed as if it was impossible to silence them unless they were engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. With no other options, Bravo Company was tasked to capture Hill 805 and eliminate the main enemy strong point. Divided into small groups, two of the company's platoons were moved to the LZ near the hill by helicopters. As soon as they approached, the NVAs opened fire at them. The situation was terrible from the very first moment. American soldiers had to jump from hovering helicopters and engage the enemy the moment they touched the ground. The problem was that the NVAs had the high ground and were well entrenched. Bravo Company felt like they were fish in a barrel. Nevertheless, men managed to get control of the situation and slowly but surely climbed up the hill, using trees and rocks for cover and returning fire as they moved up. Cobra gunships played a crucial role in this effort, particularly in neutralizing a bunker at the top of the hill. After this particular bunker was silenced, the NVA fire from the hill stopped. However, Captain Williams leading the company was experienced enough to know that the fighting was far from over. At nightfall, the company dug in on the hill. The soldiers set up trip flares and mines to protect themselves. As expected, around midnight, the enemy opened fire on Bravo with rifles and RPGs. However, the troops remained calm and were returning fire only when necessary to avoid giving away their positions. Ultimately, the enemy retreated. Hill 805 was secured and the threat was removed. The soldiers were exhausted but relieved to have survived the fighting. Unfortunately, the men of the Charlie Company stationed on Hill 902, not far from there, were not that successful. During the day, the company compromised its position by firing at enemy mortar sites. Expecting the attack, Captain Hewitt requested permission to move the unit off the hill, but Lieutenant Colonel Lucas refused, urging the captain to hold the hill that was too important for the defense of the base. That night, Charlie Company was hit hard by the North Vietnamese. Enemy sappers, covered in black charcoal and stripped to dark shorts, moved stealthily through the perimeter and assaulted key positions, including machine guns in the company command post. As it later turned out, defensive positions were poorly prepared and many soldiers had not dug proper foxholes, leaving themselves vulnerable to the enemy's attack. The attack took the soldiers by surprise. In the confusion, they found themselves under fire from both the front and behind. Captain Hewitt was among the first to be killed. The chaotic fight lasted through the night with Charlie Company struggling to defend itself. When morning came, it became clear how costly was their lack of preparation. Charlie Company had seven men killed and several injured. Even though the first enemy attack was repelled and Hill 805 conquered, the threat of new attacks was very much present. The NVAs were literally swarming the place. After the assault on Hill 805, Captain Williams ordered patrols to explore the area. They found the bunkers the NVA had recently built and the soldiers believed that the NVA had just left. However, in the following days, the NVAs constantly shelled American positions on the hill. Whenever a patrol was sent to find the source, the enemy would disappear before they could reach them. The enemy's ability to evade contact heightened tensions among the soldiers on patrol. Although they couldn't see the enemy, they knew they were there watching and waiting for any wrong move. A soldier from Bravo Company wrote how patrols moved very slowly, literally creeping along for safety's sake, and the people walking point were scared to death. Inside the base, soldiers too lived in constant fear. Mortars and rockets often fell on the base without warning. The fear of being attacked was strongest at night when men had to be on high alert. Some soldiers stayed awake until morning, too afraid to close their eyes. They knew that the enemy could attack at any moment. Even the smallest sounds in the jungle became terrifying. Soldiers were always on edge. That kind of everyday tension was nerve-wracking and had taken a heavy toll on the besieged soldiers. The fighting morale of men was significantly weakening and the heaviest fighting was yet to come. With each day, the situation for men in and around Ripcord was getting worse. If they wanted to break the siege, they had to hunt the enemy down in the jungle. In this effort, Lieutenant Colonel Lucas pinpointed Hill 1000 as his next target. This hill, one kilometer northwest of Ripcord, was the greatest threat to the security of the base. From the hill, the NVAs constantly battered the American soldiers with mortars and 51 caliber machine guns. On July 6th, the task of locating enemy mortars on Hill 1000 was given to Sergeant Granberry and his recon team. It was a highly risky mission, and Granberry planned to move slowly up the hill, avoiding danger wherever possible. As the team reached the saddle below the hill, they could hear the mortar fire. 
Granberry communicated the mortar positions back to the operations center so that the artillery could engage them. However, to everyone's surprise, the duty officer ordered the team to move up and destroy the mortar position. The team did not agree with the order and called the idea crazy, yet they had no choice. As they moved up the hill, they approached a large bomb crater from which they could locate the position of mortars even better. Granberry again contacted the operations center and asked for artillery fire to target the mortars. The officer in charge once again called for an assault instead of using artillery. The team hesitated but followed orders. Assistant team leader John Schnarr and another team member Gaskin scouted ahead. They crawled through the brush and got close to the enemy positions. Realizing they were outnumbered, Schnarr signaled to retreat. As they rushed back to the crater, the enemy noticed them and fired RPGs. The entire team was wounded by the explosions. With the team's radio damaged, Granberry, despite being wounded, ran down the hill to find Delta Company for help. Meanwhile, the team medic worked on Gaskins, who was severely injured. Schnarr, refusing to leave anyone behind, carried Gaskins on his back and led the rest of the team down the hill to meet reinforcements. A patrol from Delta Company later went back up the hill to retrieve the team's equipment. They too came under fire but managed to escape. That night, wounded team members were evacuated by helicopter. The team had barely survived. The following day, the recon team was replaced by the Delta Company. Built on the previous day's experience, men prepared themselves for a tough fight. The company moved cautiously up the hill. As they neared the top, a single shot rang out and killed Private Michael Grimm. The shot was followed by a fierce barrage from the well-camouflaged bunkers. Every attempt to locate the bunkers and come close to them was repelled by heavy fire. Captain Reliso showed remarkable bravery during the fight. He used his shotgun and grenades to support the advance of his men. He also managed to take out several enemy soldiers but was unable to fully break their defenses. Only after the arrival of air support did the soldiers manage to make some progress. For hours, the battle raged on the slopes of Hill 1000. Men of the Charlie Company were throwing everything they had at the enemy. Soldiers at Ripcord could hear the sounds of small arms fire and see the smoke and flash breaking through the night. Yet the whole effort was not enough to gain control of the hill. The enemy was well prepared and determined to hold their ground. At some point, Rolisa realized they were only wasting their ammo and ordered a retreat. Colonel Lucas wanted the company to go back and make another attack, but Rolisa argued that his troops needed rest before another assault. On July 8th, Lucas prepared a plan for a new attack. It engaged companies Charlie and Delta with the task of taking control of two knolls at the top of Hill 1000. It was planned that the two companies launch a coordinated attack, pressing the enemy from two directions. The only problem was Charlie Company had only 30 men and Delta had no more than 50. Needless to say, the odds of completing the mission were slim. Not that the soldiers cared about it though. The assault was preceded by an artillery strike from the base. The hill trembled from explosions which effectively brought no damage to NVA forces. During the barrage, they stayed inside their bunkers only to open the fire when the Americans started climbing the hill. The simultaneous attack plan failed at the very beginning. Charlie Company started climbing the hill, but Delta was not moving. This caused all NVA fire to be directed at the men from the Charlie Company who had already struggled climbing steep and loose hillside. Despite it, Captain Wilcox and Lieutenant Campbell led their men through the assault. As soon as they approached the knoll, the enemy's machine guns opened fire. The Americans hit the dirt to avoid getting shot, firing grenades and machine guns at the enemy. Unfortunately, the only thing they managed to do was get pinned down by the enemy's machine gun fire. Captain Wilcox and his men tried to silence the machine guns but couldn't find their exact position. Then Wilcox received an order to lead a frontal assault across the open saddle between the two knolls. Campbell objected, saying it was too dangerous. Wilcox, however, followed orders and led a brief assault that lasted only 15 seconds. It resulted in one man dead and three wounded. With his forces exhausted, Wilcox decided to retreat down the hill, taking the dead and wounded with them. As they dragged the bodies down the hill, the company stumbled upon soldiers from the Delta Company sitting around looking well rested and eating. Sergeant Berkey, enraged with what he saw, snapped and pointed his gun at one of the soldiers, shouting to help him with carrying the bodies. It was sheer luck that Berkey's rifle was filled with mud and probably wouldn't have fired if his rage went a step further. His temporary state of madness was a clear sign of the immense physical and emotional strain the men were under. 
A good leader he was, Wilcox resisted direct orders from Lucas to attack again. He refused to send his men back up the hill, knowing they were in no condition to continue fighting. His decision probably saved dozens of lives that day. The plan to attack Hill 1000 was a complete tactical failure. Soldiers were exposed to enemy fire without proper cover and there was no gunship support to protect the advancing troops. Captain Wilcox knew the plan was dangerous and unlikely to succeed but followed through with the order, leading to unnecessary deaths. Lucas's decision to lead from a helicopter instead of being with the troops on the ground caused resentment among the soldiers. Many believed that if Lucas had been present during the attack, he would have understood how bad the situation was and might have changed his orders. On the other hand, Lucas relieved Wilcox of his command, accusing him of being afraid to continue to attack. The long-term effects of the battle for Hill 1000 were felt deeply by the officers and men. The soldiers' distrust of their commanders grew as they felt disconnected from the leaders who were supposed to guide them through the dangers of combat. American troops made another attempt to conquer Hill 1000 on July 12th. Like all previous attempts, after many hours of intense fighting, the assault ended with American soldiers retreating from the hill slopes. After this failed attempt, Colonel Harrison from the Brigade Command decided to shift tactics and organize large formation assaults. Fresh troops from the 2nd Battalion 501st Infantry were brought to the area to help finally seize the hill. However, amid preparations for the assault, orders arrived to abandon all plans and withdraw from the hill. Despite the objections from the battalion commander, Lt. Col. Livingston, that holding the hills around the ripcord was key to keeping it secure, the assistant commander for operations of the 101st Airborne Division, Brig. Gen. Sidney Berry, decided that Hill 1000 had already taken too many men in helicopters. Some soldiers felt the decision was based on politics and money rather than winning the fight. They were left frustrated and angry that they weren't allowed to continue the battle. The fiasco on Hill 1000, however, was only a prelude to a disaster that lay ahead. While brave American soldiers bled for Hill 1000, on the opposite side of the base, Captain Straub and his men from Delta Company fought vigorously to defend Hill 805. They dug bunkers, set up wires, and placed mines around the hill. The first attack came early in the morning on July 14th. A fierce fight took place around the company's position with the engagement of marine jets and gunships. Despite heavy losses, Captain Straub's company held the hill. The following day, they received reinforcements and more supplies as they prepared for another possible attack. On July 16th, two hours after midnight, NVA sappers made another attack on Hill 805. Once again, American forces threw everything at their disposal to push the enemy off the hill. Persistent NVA attackers withdrew only when the sun rose above the hilltops. However, the lull lasted only till the following night when the assault was renewed. Although the men of the Delta Company successfully repelled this attack as well, their energy and morale were drained. On the morning of July 18th, soldiers from the Delta Company filled in their bunkers and prepared to leave. The enemy, however, wasn't inclined to let them leave so easily. Not only did they want to seize Hill 805, but they also wanted to see all of its defenders dead. Under heavy fire, American soldiers boarded the helicopters that led them to safety. Some of them barely escaped death. After 17 grueling and stressful days of combat, Hill 805 ultimately fell to the enemy. With all the hills around Ripcord lost, the men of the 2nd Battalion had no choice but to focus on keeping the enemy away from the base. Even during the fighting for surrounding hills, the base was hit with rounds every day. However, from mid-July, the bombardment intensified, causing numerous injuries and disrupting efforts to defend the base. Supplies that were brought by air became harder to get because of the poor weather and relentless fire from the 51 caliber machine guns, the notorious copter killers. The morale among the troops remained strong despite the constant attacks. The artillery kept firing even when the base was being hit by 120mm mortar rounds, the largest used by the enemy. On July 18th, NVAs managed to shoot down a Chinook helicopter over the base. The helicopter carrying ammunition supplies crashed, causing a massive explosion. Complete chaos ensued as soldiers scrambled to put out the fires and cleared the base from unexploded shells, all while being shelled by enemy mortars. The base suffered a great deal of damage. To make things worse, by that time the battalion's strength was significantly reduced. 
At the same time, Division Command feared the NVA had more than 10,000 men in the area. Delta Company was sent on a patrol to gather intelligence on enemy strength and positions. The only thing the company achieved was to get engaged into several fierce fights with the enemy, after which men were extracted from the area. Casualties piling up at the base caused General Barry to question his decisions regarding Ripcord, primarily the possibilities of its artillery to support the upcoming Operation Chicago Peak. He denied the request of Colonel Harrison to send more troops, six battalions to be precise, to the area around Ripcord to destroy the enemy regiments. Barry knew that if he committed more forces to Ripcord, it would weaken the division's defense of the coastal plains. It would also attract negative media and political attention, which could harm the Vietnamization program. He wrote that Ripcord had become a liability and a potential victory for the enemy. Although logic argued for evacuation, the division's ethos pushed against it. Barry was concerned about the impact withdrawal would have on morale. However, the main question was whether Ripcord was worth the casualties it was causing. On July 22nd, General Barry decided to evacuate Ripcord. He recognized it was a difficult decision, one that went against the pride of a soldier, but felt it was necessary to avoid further casualties. He met with Colonel Harrison to discuss the evacuation and what support was needed. Although Harrison was shocked, he did not argue against the decision. As it turned out, it was the right call. The situation with Fire Support Base Ripcord was on the verge of complete collapse. On July 22nd, a supply helicopter was hit by a mortar explosion, wounding the entire crew. The situation continued to worsen as the enemy began targeting the larger artillery pieces, forcing the American soldiers to shoot quickly and then retreat to their bunkers to avoid incoming mortar fire. Out on patrols, soldiers were so exhausted and tense that they started shooting at each other by mistake. Captain Hawkins' Alpha Company on patrol around Hill 805 was reduced to just 20 men. Day by day, the defenders of the FSB ripcord were succumbing to relentless attacks from the NVA, who were slowly but steadily tightening their grip around the base. On the night of July 23rd, troops prepared the equipment for the evacuation. The plan was to evacuate the heavy stuff before extracting the remaining troops. The mood at the base was tense. All the horror of the previous three weeks was about to end, but one last effort had to be made. Helicopters arrived to begin the evacuation at dawn. They were welcomed by enemy fire from the surrounding hills. Despite the confusion, the evacuation went on, with helicopters making trips to and from the base. Some helicopters suffered minor damage, but one Chinook was shot down while trying to lift a bulldozer. As the evacuation progressed, Lieutenant Colonel Lucas and his team directed airstrikes to suppress enemy positions. However, the enemy fire grew more intense. Lucas moved around the base, encouraging his men to hold out. At 9.15 a.m., a mortar round struck near him, killing two soldiers and seriously injuring the general. Despite the efforts of the battalion surgeon, Lucas died shortly after being evacuated. By noon, most of the troops had been evacuated and the remaining soldiers prepared to leave. The last few soldiers climbed onto the final helicopter which departed at 2.07 p.m. The extraction was complete and no men were left behind except for a scout who was later rescued by a daring pilot in a small helicopter. After the evacuation, B-52 bombers along with other aircraft began a relentless bombardment of the base and surrounding enemy positions. The area was already engulfed in smoke and fire from previous airstrikes and the B-52s delivered devastating bomb loads onto the NVA forces in the now abandoned base. Bombs exploded in quick succession, sending plumes of debris and destruction into the air. The powerful strikes aimed to destroy any remaining enemy forces, equipment, and the base itself, ensuring that the NVA could not benefit from capturing the site. The Americans had the final word. As it turns out, it was their final word in the entire war. The battle for the fire support base ripcord was the last encounter between the U.S. and North Vietnamese troops. And like the entire Vietnam War, it cost the Americans dearly. During the 23 days of combat, they had 75 men killed and around 400 wounded. The battalion's effective fighting force was reduced to almost half. Men of the 2nd Battalion, 506th Infantry of the 101st Airborne Division paid the ultimate sacrifices to serve their country. What they survived in the jungles of the Vietnamese highlands was a true nightmare. They were shelled, battered, and constantly on the verge of their nerves and strength, but they never backed down. Whenever they received an order to attack, they did so. 
it was because they were not ordinary soldiers. They were the Screaming Eagles. 